Thank you. Um, at present in Papua New Guinea, there are thousands of men and 135 brave women vying to stand for the elections. The polling has been almost completed. And I guess this is the hallmark of democracy, the concept of democracy. And many of our leaders proudly say we are a volatile, vibrant democracy and we are very volatile. I think we forget to take into account that there's a lot more to democracy than purely having an election. And that's where we seem to have boiled it down to in, in Papua New Guinea at present. As um, our lead speaker from Club de, de Madrid said, um, it's complex, it's multifaceted, and we have to actually examine all those facets of democracy. And I look at the situation, and I'm very humbled to be sitting here, to be quite frank, because at the back we have a former statesman of Papua New Guinea sitting there in Sir John Caperton, who has decided to stand again in this election. He's polled, done his polling and he's now here. And I am hoping that uh, he will win in what has become a very difficult electoral process in Papua New Guinea because there's a big difference between a politician and a statesman. And it's a statesman who speak about democracy, speak about all of the uh, social justice and all of those things where you, you tend to find the politicians talk about money for my electorate and that has become a very constant talk in, in um, Papua New Guinea, who's getting the most money for their electorate and rather than the big picture. But traditionally, democracy has been referred to by several speakers here. There are many systems of democracy or governance in Papua New Guinea, and I'm referring only to Papua New Guinea, not the broader Pacific perspective, because we are so complex in ourselves. We had, in, we had um, chiefs by birth, we had big men by accumulation of wealth, we had chiefs by warriorship, all sorts of different styles of lead leadership and, ma and ways to manage society. We had matrilineal custodians of land in some parts of the country, but this tends to be forgotten now in land ownership. So there were many ways in which the societies were, were governed. And most of it was, it was successful, if I put that in inverted commas, in the circumstances. I'm not a traditionalist who says we can go back to the wonderful past, we move on. But it worked because people were directly accountable to their people. And now in a country of nine or seven million people and a parliament house in Waigani and the majority of people scattered in remote, very isolated communities, that direct accountability is not there and is very hard to achieve. And what is the accountability? What do people expect of their leaders? It's often a very complex issue, uh, uh, what they have to expect should come from, from a leader. Uh, and often there's an expect, expectation of largesse and distribution of wealth, as would have occurred in a traditional setting. It worked well because of this, again I say well in inverted commas, because of this direct accountability to people, but it was conformity overruling the individual. And this, of course, brings real issues for us to deal with now, as we have very willingly signed off on many international conventions without reservations. And, and I've been criticized quite often by my male colleagues about bringing my Western white agendas into the country. I keep saying, excuse me, gentlemen, male Melanesian ministers signed these things in the past. They're social contracts. We have to obey economic contracts. We must also obey social contracts. So we need to be a little bit more analytical about what we are doing, I think, and, and how we can gradually live up to some of these concepts. Because we have, uh, in a democracy, the concept of individual rights is not really the norm in traditional society. The communal good was more important than the individual right. And so, we're working through these very difficult uh, scenarios of change, which um, our chair, our facilitator, spoke about uh, in her presentation yesterday. And then we have this Western democracy has been put on top of all this complexity of thousands of years of many different systems, and it's a very thin veneer. And that thin veneer is really showing now with many cracks. And it's up to us as nations to decide how we're going to reform what we'll do. I mean, how can the institutions and processes of democracy as we would like to see, be, see, to see it uh, be kept accountable? And I think with, certainly with Papua New Guinea, we have various government mechanisms to keep accountability. 
We have Ombudsman Commission, we have a police fraud squads, we have independent judiciary, the, the ind we have a judiciary, we have electoral commissions, registrars of political parties, all sorts of ways and laws to try to keep um, democracy and parliament accountable. Um, but if they're not adequately funded and not adequately resourced, it's very difficult sometimes for them to operate free from fear or favor. Uh, and so definitely I can't hide the fact that we, there are problems that we are facing at present. I think it's one reason why a former statesman is saying, I'm going to try to re-enter politics, even though he should be re resting in retirement at this stage. We had legislation, legislative attempts to manage the situation with a, a legislation called OLIPAC, the, integrity, the Organic Law on the Integrity of Political Parties, to try to stop uh, members being bought off and running from party to party according to whoever offered the most and then constant votes of no, no confidence as a result of all of this happening. Uh, but the OLIPAC law was taken to court uh, and actually opposed by the very government that actually put it up. <laughs> at, the time, at the time it was put up, I was sitting in the back benches and I said, I saw it as a necessary evil because somehow we had to stabilize the situation. Um, but uh, legislated stability can become entrenched stability and I think that's one of the things, one of the feel, feelings that caused the event of the political coup of, I mean the present government don't like me calling it a political coup, but it was a political coup in, on August 11 last year. So it's been a very interesting time and I'm not with either faction, there were two factions and in the end I said well there's nobody in the opposition, I'll go there. So although I'm called the leader of the opposition, I was the leader of one, but I'm now the leader of two. <laughs> and I'll be finished in, at the end of this month. So you can see the, f the really funny, fragile situation we have come to be and hope for the elections will, will stabilize it all and get a whole new scenario developing. So when it was challenged in the constitution, it was deemed unconstitutional because of the freedom of association provisions in the constitution. So, you know, there are many things tangle us up when we try to stabilize things. Uh, so it's, it's a very fragile, constant power play in politics. Sometimes termed, uh, might, maybe I'd talk, it's almost like a neo-tribalism, but more on a regional basis. In fact, the, one of the chancellors of one of our universities coined the phrase neo-tribalism in his university when he was very concerned about the regional conflicts that were occurring on campus, where people were conflicting on a regional basis, not a tribal, but regional basis. And the need for us to, to really work on creating one nation. Our children in school every day, we talk about one nation, one people, but only a minority of our children are in school, not the majority yet. And we really need to work a massive comprehensive program on, on education, civic education, as was again mentioned by Dr. Clare the other day, to actually help, help people to facilitate the process of understanding what is democracy and what form of democracy can work in Papua New Guinea. The interesting and pleasing thing was mentioned by Senator on my left, that uh, this has been coming out over the last 10 months. I would say we've had a, re before that, we've had a fairly apathetic civil society politicians get away with being absolutely atrocious and civil society because civil society is fractured people are more concerned with their clan and their family and all of those things we are a very clan family oriented society but over the last 10 months when it was extremely unorthodox in what was happening to the extent that a deputy prime minister went into a courtroom and had a, a judge arrested in the middle of a court case and absolutely unorthodox stuff unconstitutional things happening the social networking became extremely vibrant during that time, particularly amongst the young educated because social networking does not reach the majority yet. By 2017, I think we've got something to think about there if your people are candidates, but now I don't think it will influ influence the outcome of the electorate results. But that social networking was a good thing to see because it, was, it brought away the neo-tribalism, the neo-tribalism in the student body Suddenly they were nationalists again. What is happening to our nation and which was a very good thing. Um, uh, this inherited Westminster model, it's enshrined in our, uh, our constitution and I'm a great advocate for the constitution. 
But we all know that the constitutions should not be set in stone, but on the other hand, I don't believe they should be tested by blatantly breaking the law. And we need a government, I believe, after this election, that will really put a review process in place to review the constitution thoroughly by proper processes because we are we are struggling. Should we have the Westminster system of having a speaker who is actually a member, an elected member of parliament, usually favouring the government side? Or should we go the way, the model of the Solomons and Bougainville, where the speaker is brought in later? Will a government have the courage to do that when they are giving away some power? Can we get some balance in the funding of the parliamentary, the integrity of parliament itself? Because it's much more than elections, as we said. The integrity of parliament means you need a, an adequately funded opposition, an adequately resourced opposition, an adequately resourced committee system, so that legislation cannot be bulldozed through without proper committee scrutiny, as has become the process in more recent years. And again, because we're putting a, a round peg into a square hole or a square peg into a round hole, um, we've got to look at how can we make things more appropriate. How can we make it work, but in the interests of the whole and the good of the whole? It's a struggle. I, I know I'm running out of time. Am I out of time? Almost. Pretty what can I have? Yeah. Okay. Can I have just a moment yep. more? Yep. I'll skip a whole lot of things. I mean, that we mentioned here this tension between the the um, public service and the elected people. That that tension is there. Except with us, there's too much domination now of the public service. But how can we get this connection? How can we make this whole system that's come on top of us relevant to the people? I tried an interesting thing in the village that I married into because I've always struggled with it. We have three sources of power in that village and we talked about kings and area. We have the traditional chiefs and clan chiefs. We have the church, which is probably the most powerful influence. And we have the councillors and the magistrates. So we have the government, the church, and the traditional um, powers. So I said, let's form a pari, pari parliament, and then I backed off, because there's no good people creating things. And so I left the people talking about it, and eventually they created a council of chiefs, chair, co-chaired by the councillor and the, the um, village chief, who had lost all his powers, and yet they control the land, and development is about land. Uh, and then we brought in the sports president and the women's president and all these people. They worked out who would be part of it. I said, it must be inclusive. So the disability chairman went in. They meet still occasionally. This was back in the late 1990s. They still do meet, but I don't know how effective it is because we need to work those mechanisms. But I think we really must work community level.